Hello everyone, Jean-Marc here with a lesson on quantum third order response functions. So this is um, some pretty advanced quantum mechanics material. Personally I saw it in a graduate quantum mechanics class part 3. So if you're new to quantum mechanics, uh, this is probably not a good video to start with. But uh, if you're here for quantum third order response functions, then you've come to the right place. So um, the, uh, the man right there in the nutshell, that's Professor Shao Mukumel. And uh, he's the guy who came up with all this great theory. So as far as citing my sources, this is the guy, and this is the book. So if you really want to know this stuff, this is the book to get. So we're talking quantum mechanics. Let's start all the way at the Schrodinger equation and then work our way up to the equations for uh, uh, quantum response functions. And I say third order response, but really uh, the formalism we're going to derive works for uh, any degree of um, response function. First, third, fifth, whatever you want. So, um, let's see. So here we have the Schrodinger equation on the left. Right here, this is just, uh, so we're, our, we've, we have a orthonormal basis set of these, uh, these functions right here, of n functions, of n basis functions. And this is, uh, this is uh, their, their outer product forms the identity. And uh, their inner product is going to be a Kronecker delta function. So it, the, these, this basis is orthonormal. So if we dot them with the same basis function, you get 1. And if you dot it with any other basis function, you get 0. So that's why we have the Kronecker delta there. So, uh, if, so this is how we define our orthonormal basis set, or show that we have one. And uh, if we want to express any wave function psi of t in that basis set, then this is the process for doing that right here. So we, uh, we find the overlap of our wave function onto the particular basis function n here, and uh, it's multiplied by, uh, and we have the outer product here. So what we've done here is, you see we have a psi of t here, and we have a psi of t there, and we've multiplied only this side by that. But see, this is the identity. So this is something that uh, you do all the time in quantum mechanics, insert the identity, right? So we've, we've inserted the identity here, and this is equivalent. But now we have, uh, we, but it, it's useful because we've, we've expressed our wave function psi of t uh, in terms of a sum of uh, its, uh, over, um, in terms of its um, basis set functions here. So, uh, so now we have our, our wave function in terms of a basis. Um, okay, so from here uh, we need to derive time evolution. So this is all about time-dependent quantum mechanics. So it's it's useful for us to make uh, to derive a time evolution operator. So something that we can operate on a wave function and propagate it forwards in time um, or backwards, really. But uh, so let's see here. Okay, so we have the Schrodinger equation here, and if we multiply both sides by one of these basis functions here. That's all we've done. We took the Schrodinger equation, multiplied both sides by that basis function. But when we multiply the right side by that basis function, we'll have the basis function, our, uh, our bra here, and then we'll have the Hamiltonian and then psi. But with, with that sitting there, we can operate to the left with the Hamiltonian. And what that will do um, is it will give us the eigenenergy of this eigenstate. Uh, and plus it'll give us the, the eigenfunction back, right? That's just a, a, a normal uh, eigenvector type uh, operation. So we act with the Hamiltonian on this, it gives us the energy and that back. So that's what we have here. We've just multiplied both sides by this and then acted with the Hamiltonian. And by the way, uh, you, you may want to pause this video here and there uh, to really try and take things in. If it feels like I'm moving too quickly, just pause the video, write stuff down until you're satisfied. Uh, with what's what's happening. Okay, so we just copy that. This is the same thing here. Okay, so now uh, what we have here, we have the derivative, the time derivative of this thing equals the thing again multiplied by minus i over h bar times the eigen energy. So this is a differential equation. We're saying if we take the, the time derivative of this thing, we get the thing back multiplied by this stuff. Well, we know the form of the solution to that differential equation. It's an exponential function. So therefore, the solution to this differential equation must be this line right here. So uh, th this is our solution. Um, and if we note, 
that uh, we have uh, an exponential operator here acting on our on our system there or on our um, uh, on a, uh, a wave function at time t naught projected onto this basis function n right here. Okay, so now if we return to the notion of a wave function psi of t being projected onto a basis set, this is that definition from the previous page, but we have this piece right here in the green box, and now we have a new definition for this piece in the green box, right? We know that this is equal to all this stuff over here. So why don't we just substitute all of this in for that? And that's what we do here. So we take this equation and we substitute it in for this. So that's what this bottom line is here. Uh, it's, it's just that substitution. Now uh, we take that line and again we're, we're trying to get a time evolution operator out of this thing. So then um, we have an initial condition here, right? This is our, whoops, this is our uh, wave function at time t naught. So if we want to uh, make this thing evolve forward in time, well then it's kind of everything except for this, this initial condition is the thing uh, operating, right? We can think of it that way. And uh, this exponential function here will, uh, this is just a, a regular exponential function here. So this is going to commute with uh, this uh, uh, ket uh, basis function right here. So we can just move this, this ket basis function over there and then we say that this whole chunk of stuff is this. This is our time evolution operator. It's just all the stuff that's operating on this um, wave function at time t naught. And so now we have a time evolution operator. This is it. Okay, and the, the time evolution operator has some properties uh, that, uh, let me talk about one now. So if we have the time evolution from time t naught to t naught that's equal to identity. So let's think about that. If, if we're evolving in time, but to the same time, well, no time has gone by, nothing can happen in, in zero you know, change in time. Therefore, it has to be the identity. So if we operate from u from t naught to t naught, that's just going to be identity. It's going to give us back whatever this, uh, whatever this initial condition is. Makes sense. And what else? OK. And another way of writing uh, this line right here is just condensing it to this, right? Because we've defined this thing as our time evolution operator. So we say that, uh, that psi of t, our time-dependent Schrodinger equation, uh, comes from taking our initial psi of t naught and evolving it in time from t naught to time t. So that's that. OK. So this is good. We have a time evolution operator. Um, but the only trouble with it is, is that we've expressed it in terms of a basis set, right? We've, uh, uh, we've introduced this basis set of, of n basis functions with their n eigen energies, and uh, we've expressed the time evolution operator in terms of that, which is fine as long as we have all the eigenvectors and eigen energies for our system. But we might not know the complete set of eigenstates, so we're going to need to work at this a little harder and make our time evolution operator uh, general to any basis set. Um, okay. So um, the strategy we're going to take here is we have this eigen energy here and our eigen functions here. So if we can get rid of the, the eigen energies and eigen vectors and um, express them in terms of the Hamiltonian instead then that's, that's the strategy we want to use. So we want to, we want to somehow get the Hamiltonian in here. But then you're going to have the exponential of a Hamiltonian. So you're going to have a function of an operator. So what the heck is a function of an operator? That's not a, a trivial thing that we can just you know, write it down and say it's fine. We have, to, we have to define that if we're going to say that we have a function of an operator. So, uh, so let's talk about that. Uh, if we have uh, an operator, say we'll just call this operator A. So this is an example would be a Hamiltonian, right? So if I operate on, on, a, ba on a basis function alpha with A, I'm going to get that basis function back multiplied by its eigenvalue, right? So this is eigenvector, eigenvalue. You operate on the eigenvector and you get the eigenvector back multiplied by its eigenvalue. So that's just standard uh, uh, eigen, uh, eigen uh, system type stuff. 
So, okay, well, you know, what's what's the trick that we're always throwing at things, right? If, if we want to express some com complicated function, we make a Taylor series out of it, right? This is uh, uh, kind of uh, one of the oldest tricks in the book uh, as far as uh, things in physics. So down here, we need to expand our function of the operator into a Taylor series, right? That's the strategy we're taking here. And uh, essentially, if, if this were f of x and, f, and x was a variable, then you you know you would know how to how to do a Taylor series and really we're just going to treat it the same way in this step uh, and it just happens to be operating on this uh, this uh, eigenvector here so in our Taylor series this is the normal form we have uh, you know some order derivative and we're going to do it at, at we're going to expand about zero our Taylor series is, is going to be centered at zero and uh, in the denominator we have our our p factorial as usual p being our index. Uh, that's also the index for the uh, the order of the derivative, and then here, right? This is just uh, our, our 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 variable raised to the p index as a, as a power, um, which you know, if this was f of x, that would just be you know, you know, x to the zero, x to the one, etc. Um, so uh, this is the the same thing as a normal Taylor Taylor series, but because it's an operator. Now we just have uh, an operator raised to a power. Well, that's just operating with this operator on this eigen um, on this eigenvector more than once, and we know how to do that, right? This is this is we know how to operate uh, with our eigen. Uh, excuse me, we, we know how to operate with our operator. We just weren't sure what to do when it's a function of that operator. But by expressing it as a Taylor series, we've been able to show that we can we can show it we we can uh, we can write it as just operating more than once. With this operator, so that's what we've done here, and if and when we operate it, and excuse me, when we operate on this uh, eigenvector, we're going to get the eigenvalue out, right? So if you just keep operating until your operators are gone, then you're just going to have uh, um, the, uh, the the eigenvalue raised to some power, right? So that's a function of the eigenvalue. So what we've shown here is that if we have a function of the operator. We can express it as a, using a Taylor series to show that it's just operating more than once with our operator, and operating more than once when our, with our operator is just going to give us some function of the eigenvalues. So that's what we've done here. So uh, great, we now have a, a definition for operating um, with a function of an operator, and this is going to come in handy a couple times. So if we have f of our operator here and f of our eigenvalues here, uh, we've showed that that's equivalent, so let's just insert the identity again. So what we've done on the right side here is we've inserted the identity of, um, we've inserted the identity here for our basis set, right? Because remember, this is an orthonormal basis set, and we've inserted that. And what that shows is that uh, if, if, you know, if we diagonalize if we diagonalize our operator, then we have all these eigenvalues along the diagonal. And then if we have a function of this operator, and, and, and we've diagonalized the operator, well then it's just taking the function along the diagonal, right? Because we've shown that a function of the operator ends up being uh, a function of the eigenvalues. So that's what we've done here. Um, so now we have a definition of of a function of an operator, right? So if you if you have an operator and you can diagonalize it, and then you have all those eigenvalues going along the diagonal, just take the function of those eigenvalues, and now you have a function of the operator. Great. Okay. So because we now have a formal definition of what it means to take a function of an operator, we can take our initial definition of a time evolution operator right here where we had to express it in terms of some complete basis set. And let's say, okay, uh, we actually uh, didn't need to do that. We could have left this as a Hamiltonian. So um, one way to think of this, if you bring this over here, that's the identity, so we can get rid of it. And then we just say, uh, what if we hadn't acted with the Hamiltonian yet and then uh, and got the eigenenergies? Well, then we, we would just have uh, our Hamiltonian uh, alone. So. It ends up that um, because we have this definition of what it is to have a function of an operator, that we can express time evolution as uh, a function of our operator, the Hamiltonian.
So now we have a much more flexible formalism, and this is going to be uh, very useful for us. Okay, so if we have this uh, time evolution operator, um, let's uh, let's apply it to the Schrodinger equation, right? So just as a reminder, here's the Schrodinger equation, time derivative of uh, the wave function over here on the left, and we said that if that another way of writing the uh, psi of t is to write psi of t naught, some initial condition, and then advance it in time, right? Because that's what the time evolution operator does. It, it moves our wave function forward to time t. So that's all we've done. We've, we've uh, expanded this. This psi of t, we've expanded it to the time evolution operator acting on uh, psi of t naught. And we do the same thing on the right side. So that's all we've done so far. Um, and if we look at this, it needs to be true for any initial condition, right? We, we, the, we, uh, the Schrodinger equation must be true for any initial condition. Therefore, we can actually uh, take this out of both sides and just apply the time evolution operator itself as, into the Schrodinger equation, right? Because the, the time evolution, it needs to always work no matter how we start. Therefore, we can write this. So that's what we've done in this line is basically just uh, uh, canceled the, the initial condition out of both sides. So now we have uh, a Schrodinger equation of our time evolution operator. And uh, it's important to note that we have a time-dependent Hamiltonian. So if, you're, if your Hamiltonian depends on time, then you've just admitted you don't know everything about your system. And that's okay, because you know, the, the complex things are, are you know, in my opinion, that, that could be the more interesting ones, where you can't know everything about the system. Um, so then you know, maybe you have a system in bath or system surroundings type treatment. Uh, that's what, so that's what this implies, if you have a time-dependent Hamiltonian. Okay. Okay, great. So we have our Schrodinger equation for our time evolution operators, is basically what this, this first equation is. Um, but now let's, uh, let's try and see if we can, uh, if we can get, expression, get an expression for just the time evolution operator. So if we bring the dt to the other side, and integrate both sides, then on the left side we're going to have the inter and, and we're going to integrate both sides from t naught to t. So if we integrate d, the time evolution operator, from t naught to t, we're going to have the time evolution operator from t naught to t, this, minus the time evolution operator from t naught to t naught, right? Because we integrated from t naught to t. So the, you're going to end up subtracting this on the left side because we have d, time evolution operator. So you subtract that from the other side, but remember this is identity. So we know that's the identity, so let's just bring it over to the other side. So that's what happened here. And this, this side over here, like I said, the dt came over and we integrated, uh, but this integral we don't know how to solve right away, so we're just going to leave that as an integral at the moment. So, um, so now we have an expression. Uh, so we have an expression for the time evolution operator, uh, it, it, you know, uh, by itself over here. Um, but what's interesting here is if we notice, this is a recursive definition. We're saying that this function uh, equals this stuff, an integral of this stuff, uh, the Hamiltonian operating on the function itself, right? Because this, this is just a change of index, right? This, this t to the tau. It doesn't uh, change anything about the time evolution operator. So we're saying that this is a recursive definition. Um, so our, our function is used to, to define the function itself. Okay, so because this is uh, recursive, we can plug it into itself and just keep nesting the, 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 um, the equation into itself. So that's what's going on here. So we have this expression, and we're saying that, uh, okay, uh, this entire, whoops, we say, okay, this entire function, this function equals all this stuff, which includes the function itself. Well, if this is what the function is, then why don't I take this entire thing, this entire right side, and then plug it in, and then just substitute that in for this, uh, this time evolution operator right here. So we're going to take the entire right side and put it into that. Right? So this is, this is recursive. So if, if I take this entire right side and substitute it in for u of tau t naught right here, uh, then what I get is what we see down here. So, uh, and, and, you know, you can work this out for yourself. In fact, I recommend you do work this out for yourself. Just really prove to yourself that this is, this is how this happened and you really understand what's going on here. So just take this entire right side, 
plug it into this thing and simplify it and you'll be able to see that it's equivalent to this thing right here. So this is nesting it once. Uh, we'll give you this result here. And um, if we keep doing that, right, because this is recursive, so, okay, if you substitute it in once, well, we're still saying that this entire side is equal to the function. So then we can take that entire side again and, and put it into this form. And so you can keep nesting this inside of itself. And if you do that, then you're going to get this, uh, this uh, summation right here. So if we want to look at, uh, you know, the, the full recursion, then we're, we're going uh, to infinity, right? We're nesting this, in self itself, nesting this inside itself an infinite number of times. And uh, so, you, you know, the, each time you nest it inside of itself, you get more uh, integration here, and you, you're going to get this sum. And every time we get this, this factor of minus i over h bar. So um, these are the terms you're going to get. So what we have is a, a uh, this is uh, a perturbative uh, treatment of the entire Hamiltonian. Um, so you say, okay, great, we have an expression for the um, time evolution operator, but it's funny, in, 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 in uh, Professor Mukubel's book, it says this expansion 240 is not very useful. So you, get, you feel a little deflated at that point because you think you've got something or you think you've uh, understood it, and, and you say, "Okay, well, great. We have it in a form that we can't really do much with, but we're going to find. But we're going to arrive at a form that we can do a lot with uh, in a bit." So um, another way to write this, because this is kind of this is a lot to look at, is to write a time-ordered exponential. So this is exactly that, and it's not it's not it's not the same thing as an exponential function. So uh, don't confuse the two. So you see this little plus there, there's a time-ordered exponential. So this is just a shorthand way of writing that. This just means that. That's all we're saying here. Okay. So the problem was that we had a perturbative treatment using the entire Hamiltonian, right? So that's going to break down after very short times. Um, but if we can separate the Hamiltonian into two pieces, um, we're actually going to be able to show that we can uh, express this in, in terms of we, that our perturbative treatment won't be for the entire Hamiltonian. It'll only be for a, a piece of the Hamiltonian. Uh, and then that's going to be super useful. So that's our goal next. So the idea is to take the full Hamiltonian, H of T, again, it's a time-dependent Hamiltonian, and uh, we're separating it into two, two terms. So the first term is H0, and this is going to be, this is going to be Hamiltonian that we can know exactly. Uh, this is going to be uh, our simpler Hamiltonian. And then um, our perturbative piece is going to be our h prime of t. And this is the piece that we're going to be able to do our expansion about only the per perturbative piece. Uh, so if there's a perturbation to your Hamiltonian, uh, this could be like uh, if we're applying a laser pulse, right? So this stuff is relevant to things like uh, 2D IR experiments, things like that, where you're applying laser pulses. So this could be a pulse from a laser, would, could be our perturbation. But, so by definition, we, we've decided that our h naught that's the thing that we know. This is the thing that, that, that we can understand completely. So uh, we're, going to, we're going to assume that we know this, that we can have our Schrodinger equation. And note, this is just the Schrodinger equation applied to uh, u naught. So this is our time evolution operator um, for h naught. Okay. So this is, uh, this is just the Schrodinger equation uh, for the time evolution operator not. Um, and uh, it's going to have the usual form, right? So this, this is just the, the same stuff that we just did, only for u not instead of the full u. And also we're going to define a new thing here. So we're going to say that, um, if we, that we can have a, a wave function psi i. This is going to be our interaction picture wave function. And we're going to say that uh, when we operate with u naught on psi i, it gives us the Schrodinger picture of the wave function. So um, this is, this, and this is just, we're defining this. So that we're going to say that, um, that uh, um, our, and, and our Schrodinger picture wave function is the wave function we've been using. That's, that's the regular wave function. Um, but we're saying that uh, u naught is is the operator that can act on this sort of this this uh, incomplete uh, uh, or not incomplete 
that can act on this uh, interaction picture wave function and, and change it to a Schrodinger picture wave function. And um, let's see here. So now in this step right here, there's that definition we, we just gave. Uh, we have a Hamiltonian, again, separated into two, into a sum of two parts. And uh, if we are to plug the interaction picture wave function and the Hamiltonian into the Schrodinger equation, uh, then we can get an expression for the interaction wave function in terms of h prime only. So now we're only going to look at this interaction, uh, this interaction wave function. And again, the interaction wave function is the wave function that we need to act on with u naught in order to make it the, uh, the Schrodinger picture wave function. So um, let's see. So if we write the Schrodinger equation for psi i, um, we are going to be able to write it as uh, being, um, we, have a, we have our Schrodinger equation here, right? This is the normal form of the Schrodinger equation, but you note that the, the, H, the HI, the interaction Hamiltonian, it's not the entire Hamiltonian acting. It's only H prime. So this is kind of interesting, um, and it's, it's, it's not an obvious thing. Uh, oh, and by the way, we're get, we have a definition for H prime uh, for interaction here. So H prime interaction is H prime. So that's our regular H prime that's, uh, that's uh, flanked by uh, these time evolution operators. Yeah, and, and that's a, a u naught. That's not the, the full time evolution operator either. So that's what uh, that's what h i prime is. But this 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 is this is not obvious. So if you got lost here, this is uh, I'd be surprised if you could do this in your head because I, I got to this part and I had to work it out. So fortunately, I'm I'm sharing it with you. So here is how we arrive at that equation. So I, what I've written down here on the first line. That's just our Schrodinger equation, right? Our original Schrodinger equation for the for the regular Schrodinger uh, wave function, right? This is the normal Schrodinger equation, but remember, uh, we can expand our Schrodinger equation to be the interaction wave function uh, that's getting acted on, um, operated on by u naught, our time evolution operator naught, right? So if this is acting on i, that's equi equivalent to uh, the Schrodinger equation. So if I take this and I substitute it into the original Schrodinger equation, that's, what the, that's where this first line comes from. Okay, so that's the first line. And um, if we look at just the right side for a moment here, um, we have our Hamiltonian. And that Hamiltonian, we just said that we're going to separate it into two pieces. We have our, our h naught and, and our, our perturbative piece, our, our h prime. So that's all we're doing from step one to step two here is we're separating the, the Hamiltonian into two terms. And now, um, so this, 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 uh, these two operators added together, we can distribute this into there. So if that's distributed in, now we have uh, H naught acting on U naught, acting on Psi I, right? So this is just this distributed to there. And then we also have H prime acting on U naught, acting on I, uh, Psi I. Okay, so we've just distributed an, an operator in that step. So now we have this left side equals to this right side. And now if we act from the left to both sides uh, using uh, the adjoint of u naught, so we're going to act on, from the left on both sides with the adjoint, with the adjoint of u naught, then what that's going to do is it's going to get rid of the, the u naught on the left side. Right, because uh, the the um, time evolutionary op operator is a unitary operator, which this is this is the the, the definition of a uni unitary operator tells us that um, its uh, its adjoint is its inverse. So multiply this thing by its inverse. That's just going to go to one. So that goes away. So now our left side, we just have d d t. We have the time derivative of our interaction picture wave function. So we have the, the time derivative of our interaction wave uh, interaction picture wave function. And that's that's the first thing we need, right? Because remember, this is what we're trying to show. This is this is what we're trying to get to here, is, is to show that this we have this this form of the Schrodinger equation where the time derivative of our interaction picture wave function is uh, our interaction wave function uh, getting acted on only by h prime of the interaction 
uh, Hamiltonian, right? So we're, we've 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 we're showing that uh, the time evolution of that is only dependent on the perturbation. Okay, so on the left side we're there. That's that's what we needed it, we needed to show on the left side. The right side we still have some work to do. So we've acted from the left with the adjoint of uh, of u naught that operator. So we've at, uh, we're operating from the left with all of that. Okay, now um, let's see. So on this step, yes. So on this step right here, what we've done is we've factored out our psi i. And then we've just uh, uh, and we've operated from the left with u naught adjoint. So that's what's going on in this step here. And if we look at this term right here, this first term, um, we see that we have uh, h naught acting on u naught. H naught acting on u naught multiplied by um, minus uh, i over h bar. Well, we recognize that, right? That's a Schrodinger equation. We have minus i over h bar times the um, uh, the uh, uh, h naught uh, Hamiltonian naught operator acting on u naught. That's just the Schrodinger equation for u naught, which of course is the time derivative. So that's the time derivative of u naught. Uh, but now in this step, the uh, the time derivative operator. And this u naught adjoint, these two things will commute. So what we can do here is we can bring d d t over here. This operates on that, which gives us one, right? That's the identity. And the time derivative of the identity, well, the identity never changes. So the time derivative of that is zero. So we actually get uh, are able to get rid of this term completely uh, because of that. And then we're left with this term down here. And uh, so this term down here. We have our our uh, our h prime, uh, which is the uh, this is the full h prime, right? This is not just the interaction h prime. This is the the full real deal h prime, but it's flanked by our time evolution operator, the 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 regular u naught and the u naught adjoint, uh, which we've defined as this this h interaction um, prime. So uh, so what we've got here is is this we've we've arrived at what we were trying to show. So we were able to show that um, we can get the, the time evolution, uh, we can get the time, the, the time derivative of our interaction picture wave function. Uh, we can express it uh, in this Schrodinger equation type form uh, using only h prime. So this is pretty cool. Okay, great. So now we have a Schrodinger equation for our interaction picture wave function psi i. Uh, so this first line is what we got from the previous page, and now we're just going to follow a similar argument that we did before. So the first is to say that psi i of t is just psi i of t naught, some initial condition uh, propagated forward in time to t naught by u i. So this this is familiar. We've done this before, and then next uh, we're going to make that same argument that remember the, the Schrodinger equation needs to be true for any initial condition. So if this is true for any initial condition, then we can uh, write a Schrodinger equation for just the time evolution operator, uh, ui. And so that's what we have in this line, is that. And then if you remember, we, uh, we integrated that, and, uh, and we, had, we ended up with a recursive function. So that recursive function, we could then plug into itself, and then we got those things that we called those time-ordered exponentials, those those nested, uh, those nested sums and integrals. So that's what this is. So we've just done the same treatment with uh, u of i. Okay, so that's great. So now we have an interaction picture. Um, we have an interaction picture uh, time evolution operator u i. But we do want to be able to work uh, within the Schrodinger picture. So uh, then we, we look over here, and let's remind ourselves of a few things. So psi s. This is our regular psi. Psi s. Our Schrodinger picture wave function is just um, if we operate on uh, our interaction picture wave function psi i with u naught, that's how we get psi s. So this was a definition that this is how we get from psi i to psi s is by operating with u naught. But now if we look at psi i, we can expand that because psi i from over here we saw that psi i 
psi i of t comes from operating on psi i of t naught, uh, propagating time forward to time t with ui. So that's the second line. And now the third line, if we think about this, that the difference between these, these different pictures, the Schrodinger picture and uh, the interaction picture, what's going on with that is that uh, the differences between them have to do with propagating uh, in time. So it has to do with time evolution. So if we have it at one single time point, t naught, it really doesn't matter if we call this psi i or psi s. So these two are actually interchangeable. So then we can write uh, psi s of t naught here. So, uh, uh, so that's what we did in, in this particular thing right here on the right. Now, uh, this relationship we can apply, because remember, we're trying to get uh, time evolution uh, for our Schrodinger picture. So uh, if we look at uh, this piece right here, if we have our regular uh, time evolution operator, remember, if we, if we operate on... Um, on the interaction picture with u naught, that's what gives us the, the Schrodinger picture, right? So that's what, that's what this first step says. We expand this to this, just like we did previously, right? So here, uh, if we want to get the Schrodinger picture, we operate on the interaction picture with u naught. It's the same thing here with our time evolution operator. So we expand that here. And then uh, we can follow through. Uh, so now, uh, so, so we have that. And now let's just expand this. So on the previous page, we showed that u, ui is this time-ordered exponential. So let's just put that time-ordered exponential in here now. So that's what we have here. And if we expand that, this time-ordered exponential multiplied by uh, u naught from t naught to t, remember that this first term in here is going to be a 1. So that, that's going to distribute through, and we're going to get that. And uh, this is our time-ordered exponential for uh, h prime, or for our, our time ordered exponential for, for u, ui, our time evolution operator in the interaction picture. Okay, great. So now we have an expression for the time evolution operator, and the full one for the full wave function, uh, expressed perturbatively, but it's only perturbative in terms of h prime, so part of the Hamiltonian. And uh, one interpretation of this is if we look at this, we have uh, time evolution and then h prime and then time evolution h prime. So one way we can think about this is the system alternates between free propagation uh, via u naught. So our system propagates under under the the time evolution u naught, which is like our our, our simpler knowable Hamiltonian h naught, right? So just normal time evolution of our system, and then it interacts with the field, our perturbation. So Essentially, it's it's kind of alternating between the two, interacting uh, with its with its just own uh, propagation in time, and then uh, with uh, the external field, our, our perturbation on our Hamiltonian. Which, for example, that could be an electric field from a laser pulse would be an example here. So it, it evolves freely, and then it interacts with the laser pulse. Evolves freely, interacts with the laser pulse. So this is like nonlinear uh, optical spectroscopy right here. Um, so now. Uh, Note that, uh, so one other thing that's really cool about this, um, for this interaction picture that we're now using, that I thought was worth mentioning, is that the interaction picture is actually the, a, a more general picture than either the Heisenberg picture or the Schrodinger picture. So uh, if, if you remember from, from your quantum mechanics class, um, the Schrodinger picture is where the wave function is time dependent, and the observables, or the operators, are time independent. And the Heisenberg picture uh, was the opposite, where the wave functions are time independent, but the operators are time dependent. So one puts the time dependence on the operators, the other puts it on the wave function. And what the interaction picture does is by dividing our Hamiltonian into these two chunks, this h prime and this h naught, is we can put as much of the time dependence on the operator or the wave function. So you can think of it almost as like a fader that, you know, maybe if you slide it all the way to the left, it's Schrodinger picture. If you slide it all the way to the right, it's Heisenberg picture. And the slider is controlling where we put the time dependence. So we can go anywhere in between the Heisenberg picture and the Schrodinger picture using the interaction picture, which I think is, is really cool. Um, okay, so now uh, I'm going to have to introduce a new concept if, if we want to move on further. So we're, we're getting pretty close to, to some useful useful stuff here. So we have a time evolution operator 
for our Schrodinger equation, uh, this perturbative only in h prime. Um, but we need uh, our, our, our density operator. So we just need to define something called the density operator right now. And if you have a wave function that describes your full system, which means that you know everything. If you, if you have a wave function, you know everything there is to know about your system. And in order to convert that to a density operator, this is all you do with it. It's the outer product with itself is the wave function, which you might say, okay, you know, how, how's this additional information? And, you know, maybe it's, it's not as useful if you do know the full wave function, but in more complex systems, the more, in my opinion, interesting systems, you can't know everything. Um, so uh, what happens is that uh, these uh, density operators can be useful for situations where you only have some statistical information on uh, part of your system. So if you have like a system interacting with a bath or interacting with the surroundings, as we call it, um, this, is, this is where this can come into handy, uh, where you know maybe we only need to describe its interaction with the solvent statistically. We don't need to know where every single solvent molecule is, which can be really helpful. Okay, so more about the density operator. So let's look at... Um, how we can write the density operator, and this is just uh, following the steps here. So our outer product here, if we write that with the wave function here, here's our outer product. But now let's express it in a basis. So this is just our, our wave function in, in, in no particular basis, in, in no basis at all, and we're going to express it as a sum of uh, projections onto basis functions, right? So we're going to have basis functions and their coefficients. And um, that's what we have here. So the, the rubber of this trick that we keep using, inserting the identity, right? So if we have the sum of the outer product of all basis functions, that's going to be the identity. And if we just take that same basis function and we just use two indices for it, we use the indices n and m. It's the same set of basis functions, but this is to say that we can uh, move in, in different indices with them. Um, we can. So we're just applying the identity twice. So identity, identity. So right side is equivalent to left side. Good. Now, um, if we have this and then we operate with our wave function, we dot that onto the M, we dot this one onto the N. Uh, so this is our uh, bra wave function. So this is going to give us uh, C sub M star. So our coefficient is going to be starred because this is the, the, the bra version. And here we have the ket operating to the left. So that's just going to give us uh, C sub N. So that gives us our coefficients. So then uh, these two things are gone because of a dot product, right? So they, we have, this, uh, we have these, uh, these coefficients here instead of these dot products, but we still have the n and the m. And because these are, these are just coefficients, these are going to commute with the n, and we can bring that over. So then what we have is these coefficients multiplied by each other uh, times the n and the m. And so this outer product, right, the, if you have a vector, and you take an outer product with a vector, you get a matrix. Uh, so that's what we have here. This C sub n times C sub m is, is our row value. So this is our, our, our density coefficient. It's just going to be these two things multiplied together. And they're going to and these indices are going to show up in these indices here. So this is what it looks like if we expand this thing. Is, uh, this is our uh, wave function, and this is the equivalent um, density operator. So that's, that's what a density operator is. And um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, this, this, it's the outer product of the wave function with itself. And again, if we know the wave function, we know everything about the system. It's, it's in what we call a pure state. Um, but if, if we want to talk about mixed states where we know the quantum mechanics of one part and then the rest of the system, maybe we, we know how it interacts, but only statistically, then, uh, then we have uh, what's called a mixed state. And um, this allows us to put as much or as little quantum correlation in the off diagonals uh, as is available, um, and statistical uh, information um, as well. So if we look at this example here, so this is from uh, 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 Peter Ham's Principles of Nonlinear Optical Spectroscopy, a practical approach, approach aka Mukamal for dummies. It's a, it's a handy read, and it's on the internet for free which was very cool, of uh, Professor Ham. So check that out. But uh, let's see. So we have a coherent superposition state of, let's say we have uh, two uh, eigenstates, state one and state two. And we have uh, the coefficients in front of them are one over the square root of two. All right, so if we take this wave function and follow the, uh, the, the process, the outer product, 
we take its outer product with itself, we're going to get this density matrix right here. So all entries in our density matrix are one half. Great. So if we know everything about our system, we can do that. But now let's say that, uh, let's look at a, if we have a, a purely statistical uh, approach. So right here, if we have this density operator, we know that there's, there's, um, there's a statistical average of, of the two states. There's, um, <coughs> there's a probability of, of being in this state or that state, and it's 50-50 shot of either one happening. And we don't have any coupling. We don't have any quantum coupling here. So note that you know this is a statistical picture of what's going on with rho, and there's no way to write a wave function for this. So you know, and and if you don't believe me, try it. See if you can come up with a wave function of this uh, of this form, just coefficients of of uh, eigenvector one and eigenvector two, and get it to come out like this, where you have uh, one half on on the diagonal and zeros on the off diagonal. You can't do it. So density operators can describe states that you can't describe. Uh, you know, statistical uh, states that you, you can't describe with, with a wave function because that information isn't there. So um, let's talk about some properties of the density operator. Uh, the main one you're going to need to know is that if you have um, some operator A, so maybe an observable, if we want to measure, say, for example, the dipole, and we want to know the expectation of that operator, well, then it's going to come down to this you're going to operate on your density function with that operator and then take the trace and a trace is just summing everything on the diagonal that's all you do for the trace so um, this is going to come in handy later so this is how you get the expectation value of an observable or of an operator okay great so we've defined our our density operator and uh, now we need to talk about the time evolution of our density operator. So how does rho move forward in time? So the first thing, let's, let's write a, a Schrodinger equation for the density operator. So our time derivative of our density operator, that's what we have on the left here. And then on the right side, let's use this, this form right here, where the outer product of the wave function with itself, and then just apply the, the time derivative on that side as well. So then we're going to have the, uh, what's this called, the product rule for derivatives, right? You have the derivative of the first one times the second one uh, plus the second one times the derivative of the first one. And that's what we have here. But now if we look at this term, this is just the left side of our regular Schrodinger equation. So then let's just substitute that with the right side of the regular Schrodinger equation. So that's what we did here. And now uh, for the second term, we have, this is the, the Schrodinger equation as well, uh, but it's operating on the bra, not the ket version of psi. So this is going to be e equivalent to, to h operating on the bra side, and um, the, because it's, 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 going, it's the bra side, then the i becomes positive. So that's what we have down here. So now we can substitute, uh, we can substitute this in for that. And now looking at this, we have what's what's called a commutator, right? You you, the uh, a times b minus b times a, right? If we're going, uh, we have uh, we have a commutator here, so we can factor out the uh, the i over h bar. We'll factor that out as a minus i over h bar, and then we have Hamiltonian acting on rho minus rho acting on Hamiltonian, right? Because here's rho, here's the Hamiltonian, here's rho, here's the Hamiltonian. So this is a commutator. So we've shown that the time derivative of rho is equal to a commutator uh, multiplied by minus i over h bar. So that's what we have at the bottom here. This is our Schrodinger equation for uh, using uh, the, density, uh, the density matrix or the density operator. So this is our, our, our new Schrodinger equation for density operators. Okay, so if we have this thing here, how can we, how can we get a time evolution operator out of it? Well, we can do that same recursive argument that we keep using, right? So if we have this time derivative here, we have that. Bring the dt to the other side, integrate the left, right? So that's what we've done here. If we integrate the left from t naught to t, then we're going to get rho of t minus rho of t naught. So rho of t naught we can bring to the other side, and then we have this integral here. And now at this point, again, a recursive definition. We have rho of t defined as this function on the right here, but this function on the right here has rho of t in it. It's recursive. So if we take this entire right side and plug that into rho of t, uh, and we can do that 
uh, an infinite number of times if we want to get uh, the, the full expansion here, which we show down here. But that's how we get this. So now we have an expression for rho of t. Um, so this is our, our this is this is a time dependent density operator. So this is how rho of t moves forward in time. Excellent. So we have an expression for our density operator evolving in time, right? That's what we that's what we we got here. Our time uh, our density operator evolving in time. But now we want to be able to move to an interaction picture, right? Because this is our most useful picture here. So if we want to move to an interaction picture, because we've worked it out for the wave function already, we can get that pretty quickly here. So this this row of i t, this is our interaction wave function. Um, this is our 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 density operator that we get from an interaction wave function. And remember that if we, if we act on the interaction wave function with u naught, that's how we get uh, our regular psi of t again. So that's why we're acting on both sides here, and this one's adjoint, is because if we think this is an outer product with the original wave function psi of t. So that's all that. That's where this comes from. And, and uh, you can check that for yourself. Just expand this to the outer product of psi, and, and it should make sense to you. So, um, Let's see. So now we have uh, a way. So we've so right here we've defined uh, rho of i, and now we have our interaction uh, um, density operator. But now we need its time, uh, its its uh, time evolution or its Schrödinger uh, equation. So we're just going to write it as before, where we have. So remember when we got this right here, right? It's the same deal. Our, our Schrodinger equation using uh, the using rho instead of psi, we have commutators, right? So it's the same thing here. And if we remember, we know from working this out for the Schrodinger equation, um, uh, the Schrodinger equation for the interaction picture that we derive with a wave function, that uh, it's only going to depend on h i prime, right? This is our our, our big. Uh, um, um, Advantage that that you know we were perturbative in h i prime, so uh, so this is our our Schrodinger equation now for our interaction picture. And that's how we got that. Um, now uh, we can use yet again the same trick: bring the dt over to the other side, integrate both sides, and then we can get rho of i, the time evolution of rho of i. So this is our time evolution of rho of i, right? This this recursive trick that we keep using. And you know it gets plugged into itself. We get this this function nested within itself because it's recursive. So now, um, so good. We have time evolution of rho i, but how how do how can we get rho of t uh, out of rho of i t or, or rho of i of t? So if we want to get that. Well, we know from up here how to get that. We just operate from the left with u naught. We operate from the right with u naught dagger. So that's all that's going on from this second last step to the last step, is that uh, we get those u daggers in there to get it to rho of t. Okay, so now we have an expression for the time evolution of the density operator, uh, where we're per perturbatively expanding only about u i prime, not the full Hamiltonian. Okay, so now let's think about this. So our goal is that we're interested in in maybe uh, uh, trying to understand what's happening when, say, a sample is interacting with, let's say, again, a laser pulse. So we could say that this h i, or, so we could say that h prime, the uh, the perturbation to our Hamiltonian, let's say that it is, it is an ex it's, a, it's an electric field. Let's say it's an electric field that acts on the dipole. So that's what we have here. So if our Hamiltonian is electric field acting on the dipole, this is how, this is the form of that. So E of t, and it's a time-dependent uh, thing, right? If we're applying some electric pulse, then uh, th there's the time dependence to that. When did we hit the sample with it? In fact, that's uh, the important thing with ca with uh, calculating response functions is you change the times when you hit the sample with your electric field, and you see how it affects your sample. So, um, all right. So now h prime, we're going to say it's e of t dotted with mu. So our electric field dotted with the dipole. So now uh, we're going to substitute that in uh, in here. So now these e's, since this uh, the, since this electric field, the the, the magnitude of that uh, can can commute with all of these things. We can pull all of those out. So all the electric fields can go to the beginning, 
and then we're, we're dotting with the dipole the interaction portion of the dipole, right? Because this is this is H I this is uh, H of I prime, not the full H prime. So it's just the interaction piece of that. So this is going to be the interaction piece of the dipole operator. And um, so our nested um, our nested commutators with uh, H I prime become commutators with mu, our uh, dipole operator. And here we have our, our definition of our uh, our mu and it's the usual way right so our interaction picture we have it operating from the right with mu naught from the left with mu naught dagger so this is similar to right here at the top right with row go to interaction to the to the regular row the interaction row to the regular row is just we operate with those time evolution operators of of u naught same deal here again right so we can get ui by operating on that with these Alrighty, so now we have uh, we have a way of writing the time evolution of our row, our density operator, um, and and this this order n. This is the the number of commutators we have here, and we can think of this in terms of if if we're thinking of response functions, if it's third order response, it's going to be a three there, right? There's going to be three interactions. Uh, if it's fifth order, that'll be a five, and that's how many times we have to nest this commutator. So the row is not what we're after, really. We want to talk about uh, observables. We want to eventually be able to get this to the point where we can compare something with an experiment, right? So we need to talk about nonlinear polarization. So what nonlinear polarization is, is we want to know the expectation value of the dipole, given that given the, the set of interactions, small n here. So that's what the polarization is, is that if we have this set of interactions, and, and like say a, a pulse with an electric field from a laser, something like that. How does um, how does the expectation value for dipole change depending on where we put these pulses? So if we look at this, um, let's see here. So as I mentioned before, when we have the density operator, the expectation value of some observable is you just act with uh, you act with. Um, you operate with that observable on the density matrix, and then you take the trace, right? So here's our reminder. It's a trace. Um, so that, uh, that, that's how we're going to go about this. So that's, so that's, that's where this, this function comes from. This, we're operating with mu. So if you'll note, we have this extra operation with mu here. And looking at our previous row here, remember that we've defined this mu of i like this. So if we were to act from the left on, on all the terms here, with uh, u naught and act from the right with uh, u adjoint, that's going to change all these uis to use, or excuse me, not use, to mu's. <laughs> mu's I, it's going to change all of our mu interaction to our full mu, our regular mu. So that's what we have here. We have these interactions with the dipole, and they're, they're commutators with the density matrix. And then in the end, and, and remember, we've, we've moved all of our electric uh, field terms to the beginning. Right, so this is our this is our perturbation piece of our Hamiltonian is the electric field uh, dotted with the dipole. Right, that's a force. This is, this is our, our our force acting on on this thing is uh, the electric field dotted with the dipole. Um, so that's our Hamiltonian here. And okay, so that's what we have here. So going from this step, we just uh, move from the left with this operate with the uh, u not move uh, operate from the left or to the left with uh, u not dagger and we get all of these uh, mu's here and uh, then we just dot with this and now we have uh, our nonlinear uh, polarization function so polarization as a function of time given these operate given these um, these interactions with our perturbation which in this case we're gonna say it's an electric field so let's see here. So now the, the definition of an nth order polarization can be written as the convolution of electric fields with the nth order nonlinear response function. So this is kind of more a definition of a response function than it is of a, a polarization, right? So we're saying that if this is the polarization, if we isolate this piece right here, um, let's see here. So if we go to the polarization function here, and we say all of this stuff that isn't the electric fields, 
right? So we have all the electric field terms or um, factors. All the all the is electric field uh, uh, factors multiplied together, and then we have this thing at the end, right? This expectation value of of this, right? So you do all these commutators, dot it with that, take the trace. This operation here, all that stuff, we're going to call that s. So that's our nonlinear response function s. So we finally have what we've been really after here is, is a nonlinear response function uh, formalism. And this can be for, you know, I, I, the, I put third order in, in the um, presentation because that's what I want to focus on, but this can be third, fifth, first, it doesn't matter. Um, and that's what we have here. So there, we've defined that. Um, and now let's let's look at what happens if we do these commutators, right? So we've written it in terms of all the all of these commutators, but let's pick a value for n, right? So we've said that if if, if we go up to some value n, it's going to be a whole bunch of commutators. Um, but let's pick a value. Let's do first. Let's do a um, first order uh, response. So it only interacts with mu once. Because again, this is just to get the expectation value. So actually interacting with it is the commutator only. So let's see here. Uh, if we take this equation, so we took this equation here and we're plugging 1 in for n. So this is s to the 1. So we're applying a pulse at t1 only. So there's only one laser pulse here. If this were a, uh, for example, a, a pulsed um, uh, laser experiment. So let's see here. So let's just we're just expanding the commutator here. So mu acting on rho, rho acting on mu, subtract the two. Uh, but what we see here is that there's an interesting property in that although commutators, nested commutators, proliferate as two to the n. So however many commutators you have, uh, it's two to that number. Uh, will tell you how many terms you're going to get. But what's interesting is that they they show up in pairs of complex conjugates. So you actually only have to calculate half that many, because um, you know once you once you have it calculated for one, taking a complex conjugate of that is much faster than if you had had to do um, you know the full um, calculation. And so this is the proof for that. So this first step, we just expand the commutator, and the, from this step to that step, we just expand. Now going from here to there, we notice that we take the first the, the first operator here and bring it to the to the end right so first goes to the end everything else ships up by one and this is called uh, cyclic the cyclic invariance of the trace because if you notice these these brackets here mean that this is an expectation value and if an, if it's an expectation value involving a density operator that means we're taking a trace so traces, you can always do, you can do this. You can they're, they're cyclically invariant, so we can bring this all the way to the end. Now, if we look at this compared to that, this is that in reverse order, right? This this goes uh, mu t one mu zero rho. This goes rho mu zero mu t one, goes backwards. And uh, this is an, there's another property here, where if you have the adjoint of this entire thing, right? versus the adjoint of each individual thing. So do you take the adjoint after operating, or do you take the adjoint on each one and then operate? What happens is that reverses the order. So you can swap the order here um, by, by it's almost like, uh, it's not distributing, but it, it kind of has that look to it, right? So we, we bring the dagger in for each individual uh, operator here. Um, so, so we can do that, um, but now, if these are our um, Hermitian, then uh, if if we do this, if if we have the adjoint, then uh, then that just becomes starred, right? So what we can do here is we can reverse the order and then just write star. So the uh, so this is, becomes the, the the complex conjugate here, right? So this is this is how this part works. So we've gone so one more time. First, we just expand the commutators. Uh, we expand the commutators, only one here. And then we use cyclic invariance of the trace to bring this to the end. So now this one is in the opposite order of that one. And then uh, knowing that this is that this is her mission, I know that if I write, if I reverse the order of this thing, I just have to put the star here, and then this thing 
is equivalent to that. So if I reverse the order of these operations, uh, that's equivalent. Uh, so so I can reverse the order of the operations as long as at the end it's starred, right? So our, our complex conjugate. So this is this is what I'm saying that we have uh, pairs of complex conjugates. So we really only have the same thing twice here, right? This is just the complex conjugate of that. So if we had to do this calculation, we'd only calculate this piece. Whoops. We would only calculate this first term and then take and then then subtract its complex conjugate from it. So that's nice. Okay, so now let's look at a visual representation of these nonlinear response functions. And of course, if it's first order like we have now, it actually is linear response. So um, we use what's called a Feynman diagram. And the way this works, if we look at these different terms, so for example, well, there's only two terms here, right? We had, uh, let's look at the second last line uh, rather than the, uh, than the uh, complex conjugate form of this line. Let's look at the, the original way it was written. Because if we look at this, this, this row here, that's our density operator. So that goes ket bra, right? Not, not bra ket, it's an outer product. It goes ket bra. So on the left side here, we have the ket, and on the right side, we have the bra. And we operate on the ket by, uh, by u0 and then u at t1. So there's two different uh, um, operations that take place, but they both happen on the ket side. So at time t equals 0, uh, absorption at T1, and then we give off a photon. And then the other term we have here, so this is the other way it could have gone. The other way it could have gone is that uh, the bra side could have taken, uh, absorbed a photon, and then given off at time, uh, absorbed it at time T equals zero, and then given it off at time T equals one. So here we have linear response shown as a Feynman diagram, right? There's only two terms that come out of this. So there's only two Feynman diagrams. So these are the two, two different uh, possibilities here. Um, so now if we have third order response, now this is, this is a lot on the screen, but uh, uh, just uh, um, don't worry about it. It's just nested, nested um, commutators again. So if we do each of these commutators, you start with the innermost one and then, and then you just keep building and you, and you actually do all of the commutators, well, there's three here, so this is this is giving us one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, terms. So these are the eight different terms that come out of the third order nonlinear response functions. And let's look at a couple of the Feynman diagrams here. So if we look at R1, that's down here, second last one, R1. If we look, we have our our density our, our density matrix right here, this row of negative infinity. It's negative infinity, just saying that it's it's, it's how we found it, right? If we go as far back in time, it's, re, it's equilibrated, and, and that's, that's our, our uh, row function that we're working with. And so time t equals zero. Uh, so, so, it, so this is our density operator, and again, it's ket bra. And so time t equals zero, we operate from the left. So here we go from the left. And then time t equals one, we operate from the right. So here's the right. So first, first we, we operate on the ket, then we operate on the bra, and then time t2 plus t1, that's the later one, that's uh, the, the, the third um, uh, interaction. So then that's, this is this one, so this is uh, emission. So absorption, absorption, emission, and then the final thing is time t3 plus t2 plus t1, and then that's our emission right here. So this is how R1 goes, and let's look at one more just for practice. Let's look at R4. So R4, if we noticed that um, rho is all the way on the right, so everything is acting on the ket. So 0, t1, t2 plus t1, and then t3 plus t2 plus t1. So then that's the latest time. So it just goes uh, uh, absorption, emission, absorption, emission. So this is how we can visually write these terms in terms of uh, we can write these terms as Feynman diagrams, which can be a lot easier to look at. Okay, so now um, calculating nonlinear response functions using this formalism exactly can be very hard to do, right? To, to know, to have that much quantum information. If we're actually talking about running simulations, this can be really difficult to obtain, or if not impossible. So now I'm going to talk about some approximations for actually calculating these things on a computer. So 
The first one is a classical approximation. We say, all right, what if, what if we just say that uh, the Hamiltonian is a classical Hamiltonian and um, we just treat everything completely classically? Well, then the approximation, the, the classical approximation for, or the classical form of this commutator is something, uh, is, is something called a Poisson bracket. And it's just doing this operation right here where we uh, where the, the we take the derivative of the density operator with respect to position and and then um, and then and that's multiplied by the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to momentum and this is the negative term and then the positive term is right here where uh, the order is reversed right the, the derivative of Rho with respect to momentum uh, multiplied by uh, the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to position. And this is for uh, um, uh, approximating this in a classical way using a Poisson bracket. I'm not, not going to cover the Poisson bracket in more detail, but that would be the thing to look up if you want to know where exactly that came from. But this is a, a classical approximation. So what this means is anytime we see this commutator, replace it with a Poisson bracket. That's, that's the approximation we're making. So if we do this, we start with, here's our, our third order response function, right? Our just our nested commutators. We just replace all those commutators with Poisson brackets. But if we look at this innermost one, there's actually a simplification we can do there. So at time t equals zero, operating on the equilibrium um, density matrix rho eq. So for this, this first one right here on the inside, for that one, we do, let's see here. So uh, again, I over h bar times the, uh, the commutator, this is the thing we're, we're approximating. So one of these I over h bar to the third power, one of those is gonna come in here. So the I over the h bar times that is equivalent to, or it's not equivalent to, it's, it's uh, approximated classically by the Poisson bracket here. So now we need to apply the Poisson bracket. But rho eq, we know the form of that. It's e to the minus beta h naught, which is a function of p and q. Uh, so this is our um, Boltzmann distribution, right? This is just a Boltzmann distribution for a known Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian is a function of uh, position and momentum. So given this, we know what we're taking the derivative of, right? So, so applying the Poisson bracket, right, just these, uh, these, these partial derivatives, in the order that we're supposed to do them. And we apply that to this row EQ of which we have the form here. So now look, so that's all we did here is apply the Poisson bracket. But if we look at this, we're saying that uh, the derivative of rho with respect to Q, well, the derivative of rho with respect to Q, this is the derivative of this exponential function. So when you take the derivative of an exponential function, you get that function back multiplied by, you know, the derivative of, of the thing up in the exponential, right? It's the chain rule, I believe it's called, right? So if we look at that, we have this, de this derivative here is going to, once we take the derivative of this rho, we're going to get rho again, but multiplied by uh, uh, b and the derivative of h with respect to q because it's the derivative of rho respect, with respect to q. And for this one, likewise, we have this, this derivative of rho with respect to p. Whoops. So we're going to get um, rho again out of it. We, we, we get our rho back multiplied by minus b uh, and also multiplied by uh, the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to p because the Hamiltonian is the thing that's exponentiated. So that's what we did there. So we're, we're just, uh, by knowing the form of rho eq, we're able to actually take this derivative and it, and it gets expressed in terms of rho and a different derivative. So it's the derivative of the Hamiltonian now. So we've gotten rid of our derivatives of rho in this step and now we've replaced them with derivatives of the Hamiltonian. But now this is a Poisson bracket in and of itself. This is the Poisson bracket applied to mu and, and the Hamiltonian. So we started out with a Poisson bracket for mu and rho eq, and now we have a Poisson bracket of mu and the Hamiltonian. So we've used this. So this right here ended up being a new, ham, uh, a new Poisson bracket. So we can rewrite that as a Poisson bracket, 
uh, factor out the, the, the beta and the rho, and we have this. So now this Poisson bracket, now thinking back to this Poisson, Poisson bracket, um, this is the time derivative of, of, of mu. And the reason we know this that's 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 how we get these Poisson brackets, right? They're an approximation for for this, right? The time derivative of rho is is this thing, or we could say the time derivative of rho is the Poisson bracket. So remember, the Poisson bracket is a time derivative of of the thing we're applying it to. So if we're applying it to uh, mu, uh, if, if we're doing the Poisson bracket with mu and the Hamiltonian, then that's actually the time derivative of mu and the Hamiltonian or excuse me, that's the time derivative of mu uh, multiplied by beta and rho. So we can actually replace this, this uh, commutator with this right here. It's the uh, Poisson bracket, or no, excuse me, it is rho eq multiplied by the time derivative of mu. So rho eq multiplied by the time derivative of mu, that's what that is. And the beta, where'd the beta go? Beta's out here. We just brought it outside. So now uh, the innermost uh, Poisson bracket actually became that, so that's one fewer that we have to evaluate. And then we have these nested uh, Poisson brackets. So this is a way that uh, we could run classical simulations, which of course are, are, are typically much cheaper to run than quantum simulations, and we could approximate a third order response function from those simulations using the Poisson bracket approximation for the commutator. Okay, so this is good. But those trajectories that we need for this end up being very costly. So this one, although it is true, it doesn't, uh, it's not um, as easy to apply in practice. So now we'll talk about one other method. This is called the non-equilibrium method. So for this method, we want to explicitly apply an E-field uh, pulse. So these, these pulses, these like laser pulses is what they would be in an experiment. Uh, these electric field pulses, we're going to explicitly uh, apply those. So this was for classical, um, or excuse me, this was for equilibrium molecular dynamics, and now we've gone into the regime of non-equilibrium molecular dynamics. So we're applying E-field pulses to our molecular dynamics as they run. And uh, let's see, so the way we do this, uh, there's a piece of background information you need first. So this particular limit right here, this thing is true. right? If we look at this limit, 1 over epsilon times uh, everything in this parentheses here. If we look at this, as epsilon goes to zero, well, as epsilon goes to zero, an exponential function uh, is going to get uh, more, um, uh, its Taylor series is going to become a good approximation for it. So if we write out the first two terms of the Taylor series, we have this. So these are the first two, Taylor, two terms of the Taylor series for the exponential here. And then we have this minus one, so these ones are going to cancel out. And then this uh, epsilon is going to cancel with that epsilon. And then we have i over h bar times x. So this particular limit is going to be uh, um, super helpful to us. So this limit as epsilon goes to 0 equals i over h bar x. So, so keep that in mind as we move on here. And now it turns out that this is also true for an operator. So that doesn't have to be an, uh, so this, remember, we've defined a function of an operator now, right? We, we have a meaningful, that's a meaningful thing to us. So instead of having a function of this variable x, what if this were a function of an operator? So that's what we have here. We have, a, we have this, this operator here, this v underscore, that's an operator. And we're saying that this, this limit approaches that as epsilon goes to zero. So, great, what are we going to do with that, right? This is, so this is, this is a little piece of background information you needed to understand the next part here. So that's why I showed you that, if it seemed like it, it came out of nowhere. So we want to be able to replace these um, commutators in a response function somehow with this here. And what that looks like, so this is the, our, our response function uh, that you've seen before, and this is that, that limit that we just demonstrated to be true. So what happens is this, with all these commutators, actually becomes this. So it just becomes this, the sum of all these uh, expectation values. 
And let me explain the notation here. Now, now this and this step, if, if this doesn't seem obvious where this came from, it's because it's not obvious at all. But I'm going to explain it uh, shortly. But before I explain it, let me talk about the notation. So this is the expectation value of the dipole at this time, right? So it's the expectation of the dipole at time t3 plus t2 plus t1. So at that time, what's the expe expectation of the dipole? And uh, the expectation value is at that time for all of them, but um, because that's this is this is our, our um, third order response function. It's a function of these of these three times. But um, what we have in the subscript here, this is when the laser pulses hit, or or, or whether the laser pulse is applied. So the equilibrium one, we haven't applied any laser pulses. For the one at not, that's the one that the laser pulse hits it at the very beginning, at the time t equals zero. This is where a laser pulse hits it at time t equals one. So if you were doing this simulation, you would need to have all of these different trajectories. You'd need an equilibrium one, you'd need the same trajectory where you apply a pulse at, at zero, one where you apply a pulse at t1, and every you know combination here. So, um, you know, for this one, we're applying a pulse at zero, t1, and time t2 plus t1. So that one has uh, three pulses involved. Okay, so where, but where did this come from, right? This going from here to there is not obvious. So I'm going to look at a first order response because um, it's just a lot easier to look at. And then for third order response, if you wanted to work it out, it's just the same step applied more times. But so let's first look at the, uh, the first order response here. So first order response, if we have the trace of, um, let's see here. So if we have this commutator here, and then we operate with a dipole operator at the end and take the trace to get the expectation value, right? That's what we're trying to do. And that, because that's what we have here, right? We have this trace. We operated with the dipole operator at the very end, and we took all the commutators inside, right? So first you do all your commutators. Then you act with your dipole operator, then you take the trace, and that'll give you that expectation value you want, right? And, and these things, you can think of them as a time correlation function in three dimensions, right? There's, there's the, the way these things are correlated, there's, uh, it's a three-dimensional uh, correlation function. Um, let's see. Okay, so, so here, here we have that same form. This is, this, this is equivalent to that, right, except just for, for first-order response. So we do one commutator, act with a dipole operator, then take the trace. Okay, that's first order response. But now how can I apply this approximation that, that, uh, uh, that they used? So first, let's take this i equals h bar inside. That's no problem, we can do that. And then if we look at this thing right here, what if we can rewrite this as an operator? So I wanna rewrite this as an operator that it takes whatever's in front of it and commutes it with mu naught. So that's what I've done here. Going from this step to this step is I'm saying, let's just make up an operator here that's, that's mu of zero underscore uh, multiplied by i over h bar. And, and this thing, what this means is doing this, right? Multiply by one, i over h bar and take the commutator with whatever's in front of it, which happens to be our equilibrium uh, density function, or uh, equilibrium density matrix, excuse me. So we operate on this thing. And uh, so, so, so that's what this is. But remember that limit that I said was important. Here's the limit, is that if we have this operator, that's the, this is the same deal, right? So I over h bar v underscore, they just happen to call it v underscore, and I'm calling it mu underscore, but that, it's just a different uh, name, that's all. That's the operator. And this thing tells us that we can approximate this as this. So we can get an exponential in there. Uh, uh, with a, a one subtract, it's this this whole limit. We can put that in there. So that's what we do. We put we substitute that in there, and we say that um, this this substitution can be made in the limit that we're using very small epsilons. Okay, fine. So that we're constrained to small epsilons. So now we have our form in, our our function in this form. So now if we distribute the um, if we distribute the uh, the 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 density matrix, the uh, the density operator in into this thing, uh, and then we also distribute the so first we distribute the density operator into this, and then we distribute the dipole operator in. 
and then uh, we ha and then uh, we distribute the trace in. Then we have these two terms right here, and we can bring this uh, one over epsilon outside for convenience. So now we have uh, a trace of this and the trace of that. Well, the trace of uh, the trace of our dipole operator acting on our density matrix. This is just the expectation value of our dipole under equilibrium conditions. Great, so we can just change that. The expectation value of our dipole at time t under equilibrium conditions. We know what that is. Now if we look at this piece, well we haven't done anything yet in this step, so let's take it to the next step. The key realization is actually in this step, so it's important for us to realize that we have e to the i over h bar epsilon times our operator uh, mu of zero underscore, and it's that that operator that does the um, the commutator. And what we need to realize is that this this is a time evolution operator. So this thing right here is actually a time evolution is is actually a time evolution operator. And if we go back to our time evolution operators, we'll see it does indeed have the exact same form. So if this operates on p e q, and this is mu of zero, what that does is that this advances our rho eq forward in time to time t equals zero. So now this is rho at time t equals zero because we, we acted with a time evolution operator. So by making this substitution in the limit of, of, of small epsilon here, by substituting this operator for this, this function of the operator, we were able to make a time evolution operator. And now we know what this is. This is, this is rho eq advancing forward in time to time rho at time t equals zero. So now we just have the, the trace of, of the dipole operator acting on rho at time t equals zero. So this means that this is the expectation value for our dipole um, at time t given that we had a pulse at time t equals zero. So this is, this is hitting, so, th so this is our equilibrium uh, dipole uh, expectation value for our dipole. So just leaving it alone, what, what, what does it look like? Uh, what's our dipole at time t? And this is our expectation value for our dipole at time t given that we hit it with a, a pulse at time t equals zero. So this is how we can go from a form like this with the commutator to a form like this where it's just a bunch of expectation values. So this is extremely clever. I don't know how they came up with that, but I'm calling me impressed. So this is how we do it for the first order um, uh, linear response function. If you want to work it out for the third order, it's just going to be more commutators and more substitutions. Uh, have at it. So great, now we have an explanation for the non-equilibrium method, how we can start with this, uh, with all these commutators, and end up with all of these expectation values uh, given different pulses at different uh, times. So, uh, but there's, there's one more thing that we can do. So now there's something kind of in between that we call the equilibrium, non-equilibrium hybrid method. And this is probably the best of the three to use in practice. And so with this, we just sort of take the best of, of both cases. And the outermost bracket is evaluated using the classical approach, so using a Poisson bracket. But the, uh, the rest uh, is, is treated like the non-equilibrium approach, where we make those substitutions uh, for the operator and... Um, apply actual pulses. And so what this does for us is if we look at the non-equilibrium approach, we have a lot of terms here. What do we have? Uh, two, four. We have eight terms in the non-equilibrium method. The equilibrium method, the, the, the trajectories just get, get out of hand. And in this method, we only have four terms. So we have half as many terms to work out because of this approximation using the, the classical approximation here. So then what we have here is instead we have expectation values of the time derivative of mu operating on mu at the time that we're interested in it. And, and of course that's the time derivative at time t equals zero. And uh, if you remember from the classical um, approximation using the Poisson bracket, we ended up with a time derivative of mu there as well. So you can work through that if you want. Uh, but this is uh, where it comes from, is that it's it's... Uh, applying both methods. So this is probably the best one to use in practice. 
So that's all I have for you today. Uh, I hope you learned something about uh, third order response functions and uh, good luck.